Yes. All right, so we are recording. So happy to see everyone here today. Um, so really, this is y'all's uh, y'all session. Um, what sort of questions do you have about 2111? I know you poured over the recordings of all of our what's new webinars and blog posts and things like that. So what sort of questions do y'all have, things, concerns about that? Anything? Anybody have anything off the bat? And that's it. All None. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the thing is that we know that this is not a huge, a huge update. Um, it is really kind of lots of nice little additional features, but no huge workflow changes and things like that. But um, anybody excited about everything? Anything? How's it going with the early adopters? Great question, um, Heather. So it's going actually really well. Um, we have not stopped the early adopters. Um, so that means that there's no significant bugs that we've discovered. Um, so it is. it does seem to be going really well with that one. So we're really excited about that. So yeah. Um, would we be able to explain more about the cataloging item? Show the parent records component parts in the detailed views. Uh, John, that's one that I am not familiar with. Sarah, is that one that you are? That was like an analytical record, I believe. It's not something I've used a whole lot. Let me look at our site real quick. Um, Cause this is all Andrew's fault since he was in charge of technical services time and he left. <laughs> on this one. Um, let me see what that bug is. That's okay, we're all good. Okay, I found the bug at least. Um, I think I am probably going to have to kind of look back on that one and figure out what that is. I'm sorry, I don't have that answer. Um, and I probably, we don't have an example set up either in our test site. So I will make a note. And what I can do is I can go ahead and do a little screencast um, and add that to our, um, into our post and have that in there, so. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, 28180, use a light box gallery to display the images on the detail pages in the OPAC. So basically um, what that is doing is um, it's giving you multiple um, images that you can have attached to a record and it kind of slide shows them through is what it is. But it is not possible, um, and we have not found a way, I should say, we have not found a way yet to say use this cover image first as opposed to that one. I know that's something that Lucas is still working on to see if we can identify those. Um, but as of right now, there is not a way to say, yes, use the local cover image over the Coche image instead. What other questions do y'all have that I can't answer? I have a question for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I was playing with this on our test server and something looked a little funky with it. I wanted to make sure, I wanted to see if it was just us or if uh, it's the new feature. Um, you have an option to resolve a claims return when you're checking in an item. Mm -hmm. uh, so a box appears up there and you can click the button. Uh, when I tested this, the button just stayed there. I, I mean, it, it did it but the button just stayed there, which was a little confusing. Um, is that supposed to stay there or, or what? My opinion is no, it should not stay there, but it definitely does. Um, so that is one of those things that we've put on our list of getting feedback from other folks to file a bug for that one. So yeah, we'll, we'll get that something, and something needs to update on that screen to tell you that you've clicked on that button and that you don't do it again and again and again. So yeah, my opinion. It's not working as we would like it to, so that's one that we'll file a bug for. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, actually, it looks like we do have a um, Heather gave us gave us an example um, from our blog post. 
about that um, with the parent records. Oh, that is odd. The way that that shows. So if you click on that link um, in the chat that Heather posted, um, then that one you'll um, you'll see what that does about how it shows the um, parent record component parts in the detailed view. Um, yeah, so that's. So what it's doing is it's showing you in a better format all of the items that are attached, not items, all of the elements that are attached to that bib record that are part of that analytical grouping. Because before you had to, if I remember right, you had to click on a link that said show analytical and things like that. So this is just making it a little bit easier um, to see those. So this is a whole new tab? Yes, it is. It's a whole new tab. Yep. And is this on the staff side or the, um, the OPEC side or both? It should be on both, but I have not verified that. So that's going to be one of those other things that we, that I know Sarah is fiercely scribbling down notes that we will follow up with and see exactly how that displays. That was done. I can see that that was done in a, uh, a sandbox, so I can't quickly replicate that. Um, but we will take a look and do uh, do more information about that one. Um, and yes, Eric, that is only on the um, details. It is not on the search page, unfortunately. So that's actually a really good question. Would having something that indicates it's a linked set be helpful on the search page? Or is it something that you're really only going to care about once you get to the details page? Let's see, Juliet says, just excitedly shared the awesome update to the check-in screen that added the transfer column. Yes, just having that display um, who you're supposed to send that item to is really, really helpful. That's one of those little things that I just think is going to make everyone's life a whole lot easier to be able to do that one. Um, okay, when protecting a certain tag field, can it be specific to subfield and also specific to a branch? I don't think branch is an option. I think it's users and import, and I don't think it's subfields. I think it's only fields. If I re remember what it's I the whole tag that I remember that. Um, so it's the whole field. So it's going to be all of your 949s, not just your 949 AB. So it's going to be that whole field in there, not a subfield. And then again, not um, not by branch. Um, only by the parameters up here. Dun, dun, dun. Let's overlay rules. So user category, username. Um, so you can identify a patron category or specific people, um, and then only from where it is being imported. So, is it a batch record mod? Is it a fresh record, is it staged, things like that. So not by branch. Um, you would, if you needed to do it by branch, you would probably have to do just each person in there, which would be pretty onerous um, trying to set those all up. So um, again, this is one of those enhancements that we love having it, but it's the first iteration of it. So we need all y'all's feedback to help file bugs to make it better um, and keep it, make it more and more useful as we go. What else? What other questions or thoughts, concerns? You like a components better than analytics. Yes. Let's call them components. Um, analytics to me has never really made sense, Heather. Um, I've always looked at that and thinking it's really more giving me statistics. Um, as opposed to the parts of it. So I like the idea of components. It it's, makes a whole lot more sense to me personally. But again, not a cataloger, nor do I play one on TV. Um, so, but I, I like that idea of let's rebel against the Library of Congress and all those people. What else is happening? 
<laughs> yeah, slight side note, I'm sure you all have seen the lawsuit between OCLC and oh, whoever the other big vendor is. Lyricis? No, that's not right. I forget who it is. Um, but OCLC is Clar Clarivate. Thank you. I know they changed names. I'm like, what are they called now? Um, Clarivate about uh, who basically it comes down to who owns the metadata in your BIP records. Um, so that's kind of a fun one to watch right now. OCLC was definitely spicy in their filing of that one. Um, so that was an interesting read. If you haven't seen that, take a look. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where we go with that one. <laughs> Yeah, they were they were they were throwing words around like you know um, stealing and you know I'm stuff like that. It was just like y'all, come on. Um, so it will have it will have ramifications no matter what. Um, so you know definitely one of those to kind of keep an eye on to see how that happens. So. Fun stuff. Do you see, have any? Uh, do you have any? Uh uh new features or, or things that you didn't mention in your um uh, previous uh webinars that you wish had gotten in there you know actually the one that i really would like people to start using is article request i love that functionality but nobody uses it um and it's just so really cool to see how that works and the enhancements that have been put in there are really quite impressive um, so that's the only one that I think that I can remember that I wish um, we'd been able to spend some time on, but I think we have a total of two partners who use it, um, and they don't use it in the traditional way. They use it in alternate, alternative ways, so um, I would love to see that happening. Sarah, anything that you, you can think of that you... Um, one that almost made it in for mine was um, some either easier to access or new um, parameters that can be inserted into reports. Bring that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Share my screen in a moment. So I'm just gonna, doesn't make sense for this report, but just to have it up to show. Um, so you can now insert a, a parameter for bibliographic framework um, and for classification sources and list. Um, I have to double check when each of them came in, but list was available, but was not showing up in the dropdown options. Um, but these are just, easier ways to be able to um, get this kind of information into your reports without having to hard code it uh, for each one. And the list appears similar to when you um, scan in a list of barcodes or item numbers or bib numbers um, for any batch changes. It's going to go give you that same box so you could just copy and paste in a list of barcodes or um, whatever the grouping is with um, one per line to be able to uh, run reports on that. Is Text that field is new too, isn't it? Let's check and see if that one is new. I honestly. If, if you click on that one, I'm curious what it presents you. Yeah, just go ahead and insert it. I'll just insert it. And then. Just... Huh. So I'll have to play with that one and see what it does. Yeah, that I don't think is as new, but I honestly have not used it as much. Um, but what Sarah mentioned about the list insert, again, this is a functionality that I don't think a lot of folks have seen in reports, and it really is very cool. Um, again, the idea is that you can just go ahead, put that into your report, and when you run the report, it gives you that blank box, just like in batch item modification, where you just scan those barcodes in or whatever you're doing, um, and it generates the report based on those barcodes. Um, so really a neat way to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, however, I will say don't put like a couple thousand items in there. Um, it will, it will break your, it won't break your cohort, but it will bring your cohort to a 
crawl um, because of the way that those reports are usually um, created. It will be a very, very slow, uh, a very big slowdown if you do that. So just kind of keep that in mind. But that list one is is one of those really cool ones. And this, uh, there was a blog post on this. So I'll put that yeah. in the chat. But yeah, I always forget about it because I had to code it and I was just like, oh, you know, forget it. Um, anyways, the permission to delete borrowers. This is a new one um, that Julieta has asked about. Um, the permission to delete borrowers will be turned on because that is what the status is now. So if you have patrons that if you have staff that you do not want to be able to delete borrowers, you will need to go in there and turn that off. Um, so again, Koha's general guidance is keep the status quo of those sorts of permissions and things like that. Doesn't always happen, but we try. Um, but that permission to delete borrowers will be enabled for everyone um, who had that previous permission. Yeah. So, yeah, I, John, I agree. Probably no more than 500 if you're using that list functionality. Um, that's where I would start getting a little bit nervous. <laughs> but it's all about how adventurous you are. Excellent. I've got more questions if you want them. Please hit us. Okay, question one. Um, you talked about how the count lines was changed a little bit, so it shows more detail. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about uh, a change in reports, if you want to do reports on account lines. Um, I can't remember the exact change, but are you going to be scanning for affected reports and let us know like you have in the past uh, for that that needed change in reports? Um, I am being told, no, we can't. Because of the way the change is, we, there's not a, a good way for us to be able to look at reports and say, this is the field that's being called that's being changed. Um, I also remember, though, Heba saying something about Oh, where's her blog post on that one? I don't see it. She did a blog post on it about how it's going to change things. But um, no, there was, there's not, and that's one thing that we talked about. There's not a good way for us to be able to go through y'all's crons and figure out who, or your reports and see who's doing what, unfortunately. Um, but is there an example or, or a demo of, that change in a report yes that we can look yeah. at let me why don't i see a blog post sarah all right sarah's going to be looking for that blog post um so we can post it up there <laughs> While What's your next question? <laughs> yeah, while she's looking for that, the other question I had had to do with the background jobs. Mm -hmm. Showed that fun feature, and I can't remember if it was on the listserv. I think it was probably on the listserv. Somebody was asking about it, and and I had jumped in early without having had seen it before, you know, making an assumption, but I wasn't sure. Um, the progress column shows one of one or seven of seven or whatever it shows you the progress obviously but he had the person had a question about there were some that started with zero and we were wondering when and why it would start with zero on the progress on the as the first number and i asked one of our developers that i asked nick that and he's like i don't know um so <laughs> We don't have a good answer for that one, um, other than the general guideline that I've always been told to remember is that computers start counting with zero for whatever bizarre reason. So it's possible it may be an element of that, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either when you've got one of one and it's then why isn't it zero. Of, so we don't have a good answer for that one yet either, um, but I know that is something that we do have um, Nick looking into. Okay. I'm doing really good about not answering questions today, aren't I? <laughs> I could be a politician. <laughs> Sarah, I can't find Heba's blog post. 
I'm still still looking because I was okay. also not having. All right, we'll find that blog post and make sure we get it shared with everyone. But I'm going to ping habit too. But yeah, we do have an example in there of what to look for in your reports and what it needs to be changed to. So that will be helpful at least. What other questions? I know your early adopters are uh, probably throwing things at you that uh, um, that they're finding that they need help with. Um, I know of two things that have come up on our test server that uh, in the switch from 2105 to 25, uh, 2111, um, one broke our cover flow and there's a pat there, or there's yes. an update for cover flow, but you can't apply that until you get into the new version. So there's no way to preemptively uh, take care of that. Um, the other one was um, there were some selector changes on the search results. There's some jQuery uh, that uh, that we have out there that enhances the, the search results uh, locations. And that was easy. We, we've gone out and, and updated that code for that. Uh, which can be applied right now because it, I tested it in both 2105 and 2111 uh, um, and uh, works for both. Um, have you had any other things crop up that need to be on our radar? And are there some things that aren't, you aren't, you're not able to address by the time we get updated? I don't think so. I think the one or two other things that I've heard of were things like with the cover flow where we were able to add that to the package that's being installed. Um, so there was one or two little things, but nothing else significant that I've been told of um, that we're not able to put into that patch. So, or into that um, release. So everything that else that I've heard of should be there. Um, but let's go back to the selector one because that one I'm a little concerned about. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that, Christopher? Oh, um, I'll give me a second here. Um, sure. So, in fact, I'm working on a video today that we're releasing tomorrow uh, for the every other Thursday uh, training videos for Koha US. Um, but the um, the jQuery in the jQuery library there is a show local copy status and staff search results gotcha. tied to others okay. and uh, in fact Nick was one of the original uh, people that uh, inspired the code on that and a lot of people have added to it over the years but uh, um, the selector in that uh, it refers to the the um, the book bag uh, underscore form element, and uh, it was um, originally pointing to under that the div class equals availability. That um, that stopped working, and uh, that selector has been changed to instead of the uh, div with the class availability now we're looking for a class called results underscore available count so it's a that was quite a shift in uh the selector in order to you know find the elements that we needed to, in order to manipulate them so um i i we've updated the the code to look for both so the old the old way to, to find it and the new way to find it so it will work for either now Uh, we've been using that we've been using that code nick wrote the original code for 3.14 oh <laughs> and then then several of us made some updates and we we put out a new iteration of that and it's similar to what's out there today so it's been working all this time and then they just changed some selectors in there and we had to go in there and repoint things but uh 
Um, so we've been using it for a very long time. It's been wow, yeah. a, a great uh, enhancement. Um, and for those of you, if you're, if you're not kind of familiar with what Chris, Chris was talking about, is that um, there's a lot of amazing jQuery that you can use to change how Koha looks and functions, particularly on the staff side. Um, and uh, Christopher does in every other Thursday, as he said, video um, on behalf of Koha US. Um, with where's your partner in crime? I don't see him here, is he? And uh, no. No. <clears throat> I think he's busy. He's been playing catch up yeah. since his time off. Yeah, um, but they do a really great video, um, and a lot of times it is about the jQuery and things that you can do to really kind of make Koha function better for your library and how you're using it. So um, definitely take a look at those. Um, those are all off of the Koha US website. And then also there is the jQuery wiki for the Koha community, which has, again, great resources in there. Um, and for any of our partners, we're more than happy to, to work with you on setting it up as it is. You can do it yourself. You know that. Um, the only caution that we do give is exactly what Christopher saying is that sometimes things break. Um, the developers get crazy, they decide to go ahead and rename everything and all the jQuery breaks. But it's usually not too bad to go ahead and fix those um, as we go through there. But that is something that is always an option in there too, is explore and see. It gives you some really great ideas. Um, I've actually used a number of those on our test site um, to kind of just, you know, give some different look and feels and inspire people to, you know, Koha is yours. Ultimately, that's the thing to remember. Koha is yours. So make it work for you the best that you can. Oh, thank you, Heather. You're such a librarian. <laughs> Other questions, thoughts, concerns, ideas. We'll even take it would be really cool if Koha could do this. We love getting those that feedback from y'all. Um, get those and you know, get those enhancements filed in the community and get working on those. I think you said this uh, during your your webinars, but this seems to be a, a fairly low impact uh, update. I mean, there are a few ex, uh, new features here and there, but they don't. There's not a, a, a dynamic workflow change or, or impact uh, to people, which is yeah. It's nice. It's nice when you get an upgrade that isn't going to turn your your world upside down. Yeah, we're saving that for 2205. <laughs> <laughs> um, 2205, we do, ex we, there are some, again, some enhancements in there. Nothing, again, huge, 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 but there are some bigger things that are going to be changing in 2205. Um, but 2211, I have already been warned, um, is going to have some major, major changes in it. Um, so, yeah, enjoy this, enjoy this next year. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's all good stuff and we joke about it, but it's, um, you know, we really try to do our best to make sure that it impacts y'all as least as possible and that you have as much information as you can about any of those changes that are happening. But 22, uh, excuse me, 2111 is definitely one of those that is just kind of like those little things that make us happy. Those are those are some of our, you know, breath of fresh air uh, upgrades where it's, it's nothing intense, um, but then we are going to be gearing up to some bigger ones also, so. I know it's not in 2111, but I do know it's coming in a, a future version, uh, not too long from now, but uh, um, I had been watching a bug for the longest time, and it finally got movement on it, and they're adding a middle name field yes. in the near future, which is, yay, <laughs> great. <laughs> I say more fields are better um, because, again, we can use those for all sorts of different purposes. And I love seeing libraries repurpose those. So there's a lot of folks who can be like, I'm never going to use a middle name field, but that would be perfect for other information in there. So the more fields we have in that bar record, I'm all for because I think there's there's opportunities where we need more uh, flexibility in there. <laughs> so Christopher, what was your favorite thing that got into 2111? Um, Looking at my notes here, uh, I, I did like how the uh, the branches were highlighted uh, in the uh, patron search. That was that was neat, and I think that was yeah. sorely needed. Yeah, so, I do like yeah. that one. Anytime that that you're searching for patron and you can distinguish more about the patron, um, 
in in that list of you know results is is going to be a, a huge plus so that that was a good one for me and the other the other thing was the uh account lines was you know all the details about a particular transaction that's huge anytime yeah, they, they can make improvements to account lines that's gonna that's gonna be top of my list yeah i agree 100 percent. trying to decipher some of those account lines sometimes was just an absolute nightmare and now we're making them better and better and i know it impacts reports but Honestly, from a staff perspective, the more information we have about what that transaction was, the better it is, um, the clearer it makes it. So especially as we're seeing more and more libraries that are going to like third party integrations and all sorts of different things. So having as much information available, um, more is always better, right? Yeah, I think particularly now that um, Koha has cash registers, you know, that having that level of detail is going to going to help especially, you know, like us, we were using a third party cash register for the longest time until Koha came up with something. And that's been a, a, a huge win, in my opinion, for libraries, because you don't have to rely on outside software. You're doing all your stuff within Koha anyways, so you don't have to record it twice. It's just nice to have that information there. But it's good that they have more details and outlined everything that happened with that transaction, because those are the kinds of things that, yeah, uh, cause people to lose their hair. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and if you haven't taken a look at it yet, so there was a couple of features that came out over the last year or so um, that did not get a lot of attention because I don't know, we were all focused on everything else that was going on at that point. Um, but the cash registers is a nice feature. It came out, I want to say close to two years ago, maybe. Um, but it's a great functionality to be able to track things like um, book sales and you know just all of that cash interaction that you have as you come through this. So if you haven't taken a look at the cash register yet, I know we do have blog posts on that, but definitely explore those. They are, I've heard back from a lot of libraries that they love being able to do things like track the friend's book sale, you know, instead of a piece of paper where you're jotting down all these items that you've sold for the friends, li friends of the library, you can go ahead and record those um, and have them really cleared in there. Um, you, there is also the opportunity to use desks um, within your system. Um, so this is also, again, it's a building block not completely finished yet, but the building block is there to be able to identify a different desk. So it could be circ desk one, it could be upstairs desk, downstairs desk, whatever. Um, so you do have that ability to go ahead and even get a little bit more specific. So it's not just this branch that this happened at, but it's this desk, this thing looked at. Um, Julia, yeah, take a look for the blog posts. Um, and, you know, always feel free to go ahead and open a ticket and we are more than happy to go through those. Um, they're actually a lot of fun. I know it sounds really weird, but they're a lot of fun to set up and play with and run reports off of. Um, let me see if I can find those blog posts real quick. Yeah. I'm looking for the cash register one. Yeah. So that was actually in 1911. Oh, excellent. Okay, fantastic. Um, so Sarah got the blog post for the account offset. Um, she went ahead and posted that into the chat, the link to that blog post. And then this is the link for the cash register feature. It came out in April of 2020 um, is when we did the, the blog post on that one. Um, so yeah, take a look at those. Again, if you have questions, let us know. We're more than happy to work with y'all on setting those all up, but it's definitely kind of something to, to think about, um, you know, because I know a lot of times we libraries are, are, you know, unfortunately resorting to paper and pencil sometimes when we have to, but this is another option for you to be able to kind of track some of those things. So. Excellent. You you mentioned desks. Was there any anything new with desks this version? No, nope, not yet. I'm still waiting for it. I've I've <laughs> looked at it and it's it's nice that you can signify desks, but I'm still I'm waiting for something more to come out to, to make that more I, I guess make it uh, so that we know what it's for really. I mean I I guess I can understand it to some degree, but it really doesn't seem to have a huge purpose at this point. Not yet. Um, ultimately, what's supposed to be happening is that you're supposed to be able to identify desks as like pickup locations for holds and things like that. 
Um, so that's the one that I'm definitely waiting for. And I know a lot of our partners are waiting for too, because if you have a drive up window and an in-person desk, they may not necessarily be sharing the same hold shelf. Um, so how do you have your, your patrons indicate whether they want to pick it up at the drive through desk or at the in-person desk? So that's the, the enhancement that I'm working, working uh, waiting on. Um, I think that'll be the biggest help as far as how those desks go. Um, what are y'all's thoughts about desks? I mean, what would be helpful to have in the community to, to make that work better? I think having, you know, knowing where a transaction occurred, if, if we know where a person's at when a transaction occurs, it helps us track down a little bit more. So, you know, if down the road, those transactions are traced through those desks, that's going to be a big help. Yeah, absolutely. What else do y'all got? Doesn't have to be about upgrades, it can be anything. While y'all are thinking of all your many questions, um, I am going to pull up and share with you the link for Koha Con 2022. Let me grab this. Um, so Koha Con 2022. So Koha, we have Koha US, which holds the Koha US Conference in the United States every year. Then we also have Koha Con, which is the international conference. Um, this year, we are incredibly fortunate that those two are going to be um, held at the same time. So kind of a combined process where Koha US is sponsoring, presenting, coordinating, dealing with all the hair pulling out um, in the planning of Koha Con 2022. So we're going to have um, international representation um, at this conference. It's an amazing opportunity to meet folks that are using Koha from all over. Um, so definitely take a look at that one. It is free, um, which still just amazes me that we have these free conferences and the opportunity to do it. And it is going to be in Kansas, which is really kind of exciting to see it um, in that area. So it's going to be in Lawrence, Kansas, and it is going to be September 20th through 23rd. Um, full slate of presentations and then Hackfest. Um, and just lots of opportunity to kind of talk with other folks and learn from people all over the place. The schedule has been posted um, with the presentations that are going to be there. Um, so really kind of some interesting things. If you are not able to make it in person, um, it is being streamed. So you can go ahead and register um, to um, view it online. Unfortunately, we still are dealing with travel restrictions. And so not as many people in person as we would like to see, but there still will be quite a few folks there. Um, and hopefully we'll have more coming in. So um, there will also be on day three, um, some special interest groups discussions, which are always fun um, to see what's going on with those. And uh, if you're not familiar with Koha US SIGs, definitely take a look at those too, because again, they are great opportunities to kind of just talk to other folks that are doing the same thing. Um, you know, well, how do you do this? And what about this? And how does this change? And has anyone tried that sort of thing? Um, some really cool things to definitely take a look at when you're doing those. Can I just add on that, you know, we, we packed uh, day three and four. You, you, traditionally with Kohakan, that is Hackfest, but we packed that with uh, special interest groups and some workshops so that there is something for everybody. I know that Hackfest isn't everybody's cup of tea, but we wanted to make sure that there was more going on on those days so that there was something more for everybody. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about Kohakan, we've been having this discussion uh, we had this discussion with our board meeting today for uh, Koha US, and want to really encourage people, if they have the opportunity, if they have the means and the funds, please come out, if at all possible. One of the greatest things about the annual conference, just with Koha US, but even with, you know, Koha Khan, 
we get to meet each other all the time online, but generally that is a one-on-one -on -one thing. It isn't, you know, uh, it, it, you're not networking as well as you could as if you were in person. And that's the big thing about the conference. You know, we wanna encourage people to come because we want people to make those connections and to network. And it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's so different than meeting online. And it also gives you an opportunity to get away and get a new fresh perspective. And, you know, when you're collaborating with people and brainstorming and, and doing all these things that you normally can't do in a, in a venue like this, uh, it makes a huge impact on the community and uh, just with uh, connecting with people and sharing ideas. I think it's a it's a great opportunity. And if you can come in person, make that happen, you know, I think it's going to be that much better for you. 100%. I mean, um, the last Kohakon that I went to, I learned so much more outside of the workshops than I did in the workshops. I mean, I learned stuff in the workshops too, but those conversations that happen, as you all know, outside of the conferences, over lunch, in the evenings, um, just meeting people. One of the challenges that we do see with, with dealing with every element of Koha is that so much of it is text-based. It is all emails and through Bugzilla and things like that. And you don't get the full nuances. Um, so once you have met so-and-so in person, when you see their comments on the bugs, it gives you a little bit better understanding of what they're saying and, and things like that. And it's just, honestly, it's a little fangirlish fan that, you know, you like, the first time I met Katrin, I was like, oh my goodness, your name is everywhere in the Koha community and I'm meeting you in person. And it's just really kind of cool to meet these names that you see all over the place. So this will be your opportunity to rub elbows with Christopher among other people. So y'all definitely need to kind of <laughs> come on out. <laughs> <laughs> there will be seven of us from Bywater in person, um, so we are very much looking forward to that. Um, there will be uh, the famous duo, Kelly and Jesse, our Monday Minutes um, experts, are going to both be there. Um, I'm also going to be there. I'm doing a presentation with Kelly. Um, we will also have Lucas, our amazing Lucas, is there doing a presentation with Jay-Z. Um, and then um, Nick, Kid Clamp. Um, of course, is going to be there. Um, so he's doing a presentation or two. And then um, one of the ones that I am really looking forward to is going to be on day two, um, funding QA and joint development. And that is going to be presented by Brendan and Nate um, from Bywater, and then also with their counterparts from other companies um, in other parts of the world. So that is going to be, I think, a fascinating um, presentation to be able to kind of see how everyone is doing that same sort of thing um, in different perspectives. And that's one of the things I do love is I love seeing what other libraries are doing in other parts of the country, other parts of the world um, with cohorts and getting those great ideas. So if you at all have a chance and then potentially you'll be able to meet the Avenging Chicken if you're there in person too. All right, well, I think we have drawn this to an end. Um, yes, Todd, it is going to be streamed. Um, so if you can't make it, you can go ahead and stream it. Just make sure you go online and register and mark yourself as a virtual attendee so that you get that link and things like that. Um, but it will be um, streamlined for that one. Oh, thoughts on Elasticsearch versus ZebraSearch. Um, oh. I'm gonna go with Elasticsearch, Joe, just because it gives you the flexibility to control it. Um, and that is such a big thing, is that I get to decide what's important. And depending on my library, I may view this field as being more important than this field. So I love the flexibility with being able to control Elasticsearch. Um, we actually are moving all of our partners over to Elasticsearch. It is a slow process. Um, but we are moving everyone over to that because they do like that control and actually all new partners that are, we're bringing on board as of, I want to say probably the end of last year, um, we are bringing them on on Elasticsearch. Um, so it's it's just definitely more flexible and, and just the control over it is incredible. Um, and Nick is working on a lot of the um, things to make sure it is happening. He is our expert is that one. Um, if Heather loves Elastic, then you know what, we're all set. Um, but yeah, it's, it definitely is one of those things that I would recommend looking at. There are a few caveats, um, but again, that's kind of a conversation to have Nick involved on that one 
um, as far as any cautions, but um, from all the partners that I've talked to, their, their patrons honestly don't even notice the difference. Um, staff occasionally will notice the difference, but not in bad ways from what I've been told. So. All right, thank you all so much. Good to see everyone here. Thanks for hanging out with us for a little bit. Um, we will post this recording on with the rest of our recordings and uh, I hope everyone has an awesome day. It's great to see everyone. Thank Bye. You.